Hello everyone and welcome back to getting started with Roll Creator 2. In this video, we are going to go over the process to adding textures to the terrain, organizing them, and then go over the settings available to adjusting the look and displacement of a few textures. We will also cover a few strategies to exporting your terrain's textures to another engine. But first, there is an update I want to let you guys know about that is slightly different from what I've said in a previous video. Before, the max real-time generation resolution of a terrain was 8K. Now it is 16K. This means you can have a really high resolution small terrain or a native resolution large 16 kilometer terrain at a one meter precision level. Keep in mind that 16K map will pay a hefty toll on your system, so it is better to work at a smaller resolution and then upscale it to a higher map size if that is your intent. It is also recommended to have a minimum of 3.5 gigabytes of VRAM to sustain smooth workflows with this map size. For me, I only have right now 2 gigabytes of VRAM and this, the software will not let me add a precision level or a resolution of a terrain that is a 16K. It defaults to 8K. So just make sure you have at least 3.5 of VRAM, otherwise your default is still 8K. So what I'm going to do first, let's go and add a couple filters. Uh, the first one I want to add is go ahead and select uh, erosion fluvial. And then I'm going to add ridged. But I want ridge to be first, so I'm going to select this little arrow. I don't want the ridge to be this pronounced, so I'm going to change the strength to 50. And then for the erosion, I'm going to do something a little different. I don't want everything to be so um, powerful right here. So I'm just actually going to do a little something here, add the strength, but we're going to decrease the depth to four. All right. So what this did is in a previous video, I talked about depth a little bit as how deep those erosion striations were. Um, it's a little bit different than what I said. It does talk about that, but the actual depth is affected most when you change general strength. But with depth, it's changing the pixels at which the width and depth of this terrain is calculated. So the lower the value, the more the terrain is basically eroding and the higher the value, the least the terrain is eroding on a smaller scale. So it looks more like small streams or little creeks, but with a lower depth, it just looks like the whole side of a mountain has essentially just eroded. And a couple more things I'm going to change is go over a little bit of the strength step value here. I want to take this down just a tad because I don't, oh, I mean, not that much. Let's go back to 20. Because I don't want these fine uh, erosion details to really pop. I want it to be a little bit more subtle. So then I'm going to bring up the level step strength of 16 just a tad. Maybe too much, way too much. Let's go to 80. So I know these numbers are uh, look like they were in reverse, but what you need to think about is the top level strength changes the large scale and the lower level strength here, this higher number changes the more minute pixels. This is This number is talking about how many pixels across the entire terrain it's affecting. So by me changing 16, there are 16 pixels from this point to this point that is being calculated in the erosion. So now like say 32 is double that. So I'm going to increase this just a tad. And drop it down. I don't want it that high. Let's say 40. All right. And I'm going to take 128 and pop it down just a smidge. All right, good. That's the effect that I'm wanting wanting to go after. Right there. Let's go back. Just make sure. All right. So what Ridge did is let's go back. Let's go to the top view real quick. Let's uncheck it. So by default, 
you can kind of see a ridge line right here and a little bit of one right here, but I'm wanting that to be more pronounced as like a sharp edge. So ridged or even the small ridges does exactly that. It creates a peak, as you can see, right here. And even more so when you look at it, look at this whole whole top of the ridge here. There we go. So it just gives much more of a sharp edge to uh, the top of this mountain range here, which is what I'm wanting to do for my texturing real quick. So now that we got this, let's just uh, start going and adding some textures. Let's go over to the texturing tab. Now, as before, as we learned, let's just go ahead and add layer. And this brings up the layers panel that we're so used to. So let's go ahead and add a texture. And then I'm going to pick. Where is it at? This grass ground number one. But let's go back. Let's uh, let's go ahead and go back to this and uh, talk about this for a second. This is the, the textures panel and you can search by the name of it. If you know the exact one name or you can search based on the diffuse or the color map, you can just search by the normal or the displacement map or i.e. the height map. It's best to just look only at the diffuse because if you just select diffuse or which uh, uh, texture of the diffuse, it automatically brings in the normal and the displacement map with it. As you can see right over here in, in this panel, that's the, uh, the t grass texture that I chose and it automatically brought in the corresponding textures with it. If you choose something like normal or displacement, I believe it only just brings in the normal or only just brings in the displacement. It doesn't bring all three with it. So it's best to just go ahead and deselect these two here and only bring in the diffuse because it automatically brings in all of them. And also you can import your own textures. There's two ways to do this. The first is just to click import right here. And then you have to select all three of the different maps from your computer. So let's just select a uh, diffuse map. Now that's not the right size. It has to be, make sure that it's a square. A perfect square like this ground clay so here is the color map of that one and you see all it brings that in so you have to do the same thing for the normal and the displacement map we're not going to import one here we'll go over some uh, custom import options and things later on um, and the other way to do this is by is by pu putting your three textures in the texture folder of World Creator 2's uh, application folder. And but you have to make sure they're named in a corresponding way. Now let's add two more textures. I want to just add these two textures because I'm going to show you some of the displacement and uh, or not displacement, but the distribution. Um, effects later so we need something to compare it by but I'm going to go ahead and uh, pick this dark crack cliffs imported that and I'm going to add one more and I want to pick this snow clumpy ground right here all right we're going to for now turn off these second two that I have picked and then we're going to zoom in just here and you can see uh, by default, all of your textures tile, and we don't want to do this necessarily. So what we do is we go to the general tab and eliminate tiling. And you can see it's for the most part eliminated most of the tiling. What this does, it's basically an effect in a noise blending factor based on something similar to LODs or levels of detail. So if I zoom in, you can see the subtle change right Right there, you can kind of see between these two points that the texture is getting a little bit more detailed. So, and if I zoom out, you can see the texture is increasing in size. So it's it's trying to add a level of detail based on the distance of your camera. So the further more detail pops out from the original texture at a certain size, and when I zoom out, that texture blends together in certain algorithmic ways but it also increases in scale so it doesn't look so miniature of a texture whenever you zoom out, which is pretty pretty common what you want to do right here. But keep in mind this eliminate tiling could be a little bit taxing on some GPUs. So if you're wanting to use World Creator just to specify some texture zones based on the distribution that we're going to talk about later, it's best to just keep this off and then you're able to work much faster 
And then later on, if you're wanting to just do some screenshots or do some in uh, in engine rendering here within World Creator, you, you need to just go ahead and select this so your screenshots don't look so tiled. The other thing is height based, and we're going to cover that in just a little bit. And then we're going to cover a little bit in triplanar. But what this is, is you could see that the side of this mountain here is taking a 2D texture and extruding it three dimensionally. So it's stretching that texture to fill in this gap. So instead of you, so what triplanar is, it's, it's instead of using one texture to render the mesh from the top, triplanar method will render the texture three different times, one each of X, Y, and Z directions, and calculates a percentage of the mesh to use one of the three textures. It is a very simple process, but since it is rendering three textures instead of one for the same texture, you may experience some performance drag. So if you turn on triplanar, you can see that that texture is now added to the side of the mountain and it's not stretched. But keep in mind, this is very taxing on your GPU. As you can see right here, it is on mine just a tad. And for this factor, it, it's set by default at 0.5. I wouldn't go any higher than one because anything over one gets a little bit weird looking. So just I would just keep that by default at 0.5. The next thing you have here is this Perlin noise. Now Perlin noise is exactly the same as the Perlin noise that we discussed in the previous video regarding filters. So you can see right now I don't have Perlin noise checked and this is what the terrain looks like. So let's go ahead and click on Perlin noise and you can see just the little subtle subtleness into the terrain there. All this is doing is changing the normal. It's adding a different um, noise to your normal map for the entire terrain. So it's adding just a little bit extra detail in how the light from the sun path hits the terrain. This is not necessarily required. It's really just for the effect within World Creator 2. But for the purpose of this video, we're just going to keep this off so we can work a little bit more smooth. Now let's go back to textures here and talk a little bit about some of the things here in this layers panel. So we could duplicate this texture if you want. Duplicating a texture could help have two different distribution properties or two different um, texture properties for the same texture, giving you much more variation in your terrain or your texturing. I'll show an example of this in a, in a little bit. And right here, you could save the heat map. And as the heat map, as you know, is enabled by this little button up here. So the heat map shows everywhere that the texture is being applied to. So if we enable this, we can see, let's go ahead and hit F to focus back. You can see the entire terrain is red. This is because technically the first texture in your layer panel doesn't have to be distributed in a different way down down here under the texture distribution properties because it is technically covering the entire terrain because it's the first one down at the very bottom. It sounds so simple, but logically that's the way it works with the layers. So because of this, try beginning your layers with the textures at the lowest point of your mesh. Stack them on top of each other from lowest point to highest point. So let's turn off this enable heat maps here. And so what I mean is, so at the very bottom of this texture, we're going to have the grass. And in a bit, we're going to enable the cliffs and we're going to have the cliffs on top of the grass and also the snow on top of the cliffs, which is how we have them ordered here in a sequence of not necessarily time like we talked about in the previous video, but in an actual layering system of what they would occur like in real life. So the heat map won't necessarily you need to save for the first texture, but you could or should for the next two textures. And we'll go over that in just a second. And let's say you picked a texture here, but you don't necessarily want that texture. Well, you could remove it and then add, or you can click this to fuse. See, click on texture to change it. Pretty simple. So click on it, click on any corresponding diffuse texture, and it'll replace all of the other textures that go with it in the texture properties panel. Be sure, though, that when you do this, only select the diffuse, because if you click on the normal map here or the height map, it'll only change those two textures. But if 
if you select the diffuse map and then change that, it brings in all the corresponding textures with it. I feel like if you select any of these, it should just bring those in, but maybe there's a different height map or a different normal map for a different grass texture that you want by some chance and it gives you that flexibility. So here's a new naming convention that we haven't seen before, the tag. Tag is the name you're going to name the texture in regards to when you export this material to a third-party application like Unity, UE4, or even a Substance program. This is basically the same thing as a material ID in those maps. Be sure to match a common nomenclature that is you're used to um, right here so you're able to import those correctly in those third-party applications. We're not going to worry about naming this because in this video, we're not going to be bringing those into those third party applications just yet. But I will show you that. So let's scroll down just a little bit so we can see more of that what we have. So this tile size here is basically the size of your texture tile. To show this, let me go ahead and turn off the eliminate tiling so we could see what's going on. So right now, let me zoom in just a tad bit more. All right. So right now we could see the texture is this size on the terrain and by default it's set to five this is based on meters so this little block of texture right here is five meters by five meters if you want this texture to span the entire terrain or the entire landscape just hit this button right here so fit to terrain size and it expands that texture to fit the whole terrain but we don't want that because obviously a leaf isn't going to be this big so we need to go ahead and just hit the D for default. And it'll bring us back to where we were. You can even change the size manually by unchecking this lock tile. So if you want it to be five meters this way, but 10 meters this way, you could totally do that. Granted, it does stretch it. So I recommend not to do that unless you have a texture Unless you're importing a texture like I was trying to earlier that's a different size, you can scale those properly here. And that would be the way to do it. You can also offset where the tile begins or ends. So let's just increase this. You can see it's shifting a little bit. I'm going to unlock this and only shift it in the x-axis. You can see it moving in the x-axis or move it only in the y-axis. I'm going to keep those locked. And I'm just going to go ahead and just click D back to default. Now that we covered that, I'm going to go ahead and eliminate the tiling. Go back to textures. And this next thing is the shade. So I'm going to go ahead and click this white box here. And then by it brings up this other color panel. And this color panel allows you to change the shade to any color that you want. Let me bring over just a tad. So any RGB color, even the alpha color. If you have a hex, you could type that in. You can even change the sliders to HSVA or HSLA. You can even change right here. If you click here, change the brightness and saturation, or you can change the light and hue. But what this does is it adds any color you want as a shade or a tint on top of the base color of this diffuse map right here. The white value is the default value, so it's adding no color whatsoever. But say I just want to add a blue. We can tint it with a certain shade of blue. Or if we have a brown, we can tint it with a certain shade of brown or some type of gold, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is pretty handy if you have two different grass textures or two different rock textures or dirt textures that are completely different types of color, but you like their their diffuse or normal map or their the actual blending of those two textures together to make something more unique. You can colorize them by making their shades pretty similar so that the whole terrain looks pretty coherent. I'm going to exit this and I'm going to go back to the default values here. There we go. All right, so this metallic slider here, if we increase it and changes it to a metal, essentially. So it adjusts how metallic the terrain is. The default is a zero, which stands for a dielectric material. One is, of course, full metal. Same thing for smoothness. So smoothness adjusts how rough or smooth the terrain is as far as how it's reflecting the light. 
So zero is 100% rough. So it's 100% uh, not going to reflect uh, the light right back at you. But if you set this at one, you're essentially turning the terrain almost into a pure mirror. So what metallic and smoothness do is they both adjust the specularity of light, of how the light hits the terrain. So I'm hoping at some point we can add a metallic roughness map or a specularity map in addition to the diffuse and normal and height map so that these two values automatically adjust to what the alpha map of the metallic roughness uh, map would generate. But right now you're given full control as to exactly what they are. And of course you should be aware of the brightness and contrast. You can essentially change how bright or how dark it is and the contrast. Of course the contrast could be the one that you change the most because that could help with the saturation values of blending into a, pre a previous texture or a corresponding texture. We're going to ignore this height scale right now because it has to do with the height based texture properties. We're going to cover that in just a little bit when we talk about these other two textures. Now let's go down to the texture distribution properties. These will be very, very similar to the filter distribution properties we went over in the previous video, but with a few additions. One thing extra that we have here is this cavity. So if you select the cavity, you can choose between convex and concave. To explain this a tad, I'm going to go ahead and enable these other two textures. All right, so now we have the entire terrain covered in snow. So we're gonna select, now that we have the snow selected, we're gonna go down here, and then we're gonna choose convex. And then what convex does, it adds, it distributes the texture to any curve that is a convex curve, so the outer loop of this curve. The concave is the complete opposite, so it puts the snow in the cavity of the curve. This is something that we all should have known from geometry class. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, select convex since it's snow and want the snow to be here at the peak. Now for this, we can clearly see where the snow is, but if you had two, two grass textures and you're trying to put a grass texture in the concave of another grass texture, you'll definitely want to go over here and enable heat maps like we've talked before, and you can clearly see where the texture is being applied. So this heat map, everything in red, is what prints out as a white value when you save the heat map, and we're going to show you all of that at the end of this video. This is a this is a technique that also comes in very handy when you're creating biomes or different ecosystems within the same texture. We'll have a whole series of videos to show you how to create different biomes. Even actually the next video is going to cover it on a tad when we go over areas. But we're going to go ahead and just turn off the heat maps because we can clearly see what we're doing with the uh, snow here. So since we had selected convex, you can see some uh, three more properties here had shown up. The steps, what this is, is think of these steps as the range of the calculation. Basically, how many pixels are considered in the formula? So right now it's four pixels or four meters by four meters across the whole terrain here in a little bit is addressed in the calculation. So let's just click here and add a little bit more. You can see more of the convex has been added to the calculation. Or let's decrease it slightly you can see little of it has being added to the calculation. I'm just going to go ahead and keep this at, let's add it to probably seven. Yeah. And so the next one is step size. This adjusts the size at which a concave and convex edge begins. So right here, if we zoom in, this size adjusts where this edge begins or ends. So I'm going to slide this down a little bit. You can see it's in, it's uh, increasing up here, but I don't want it to go up there. I want it to be much further down the mountain here because we want this snow to look like it's actually covering the top. So 
I think 12, a little over, a little under 12 is fine. We're going to be doing some different things here in just a little bit. And the strength is basically the intensity or even the smoothness of the convex concave areas in relation to the non-calculated areas next to it. It's basically adjusting the blending value between the two textures. So let's go ahead and turn on the heat map here. And let's just zoom right in. Wait, do I have this? Okay, never mind. So where'd it go? Here we go. So the strength adjusts this blending value between the red and the white. So if we want it to be a little bit stronger, it's hard to tell, but this, this blending value gets much more sharp. Or let's click way over here. There we go, that's easy. So you can see the how granular this is or the gradient uh, is a little bit more stretched out. With snow, snow is much more fine uh, or sharp edge. It's there. There's you're not going to see much of a uh, another texture below it. So let's just go ahead and keep this at six, and then maybe just a tad bleeds through due to the transparency of snow. Now the next one is surface noise, and this is very similar to the filter surface noise that we had talked about before. So we're gonna go ahead and click surface noise. And then you can see it's adding a cloud texture over all the snow, but we don't really want that. We want the snow to be full and complete on this ridge. So if you want to know what all of these sliders are, please go see the filters um, video because I go over each and every one of these meanings. So we're gonna uncheck this because we want the snow to cover the top. And the next one that we really want to do for the snow is the height range. And we've talked about height range with um, the previous videos, but we're going to see it even more so here because I don't want the snow to be over across all of these locations because this is on the lower part of the valley. So I want the snow to just be here at this cap and it may appear here too. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn on our uh, where are they observer tools so we could see right here giving us where we know the elevation line is so about right there it says 160 meters on the e the elevation right up here for the z axis but what i'm going to go ahead and do is set it to 150 see where that that gives us all right so 150 is fine and let's go ahead and change the smoothness to 50 there we go i want it to bleed out just a tad like it is so now we have a new little feature here called height noise. What height noise is, let's go ahead and click it. It adds, it's almost just like surface noise, except it adds that, that noise effect just where the height range is. So right at, since we set this at 150 meters, this height noise is going to be applied right at the 150 meter line. As you can see, it added a little bit some here and you can see this edge here change so let's go ahead and turn this off and you can see see how smooth this is and we want it to add a little bit of noise and we added said noise so these settings apply all the same as the surface noise but what i want to do is i want to increase i want to decrease the scale a little bit so it's not so fine and i want to change the size to something actually yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to I wanna make them just a tad bit smaller than where they are. That looks about right. Okay. And I don't want to have to, I don't want to mess with any of these just yet. Um, I'll leave that up to you or we can do another video where I go over um, some more designed elements. But since we already covered these um, noise settings, uh, you should get the idea of what they do. So this next setting here is the follow sun setting. So to, do, to illustrate this, I'm actually going to select the rock texture underneath. We're going to scroll down and I also only want this texture to appear at a certain range because I want to show some of the grass here in the valley. So a height range, our observer tools are on and I want that to begin, let's zoom around here. I want that to begin somewhere here at the base of this mountain. So my elevation value says 62. I think I'm going to go ahead and set this to 70. All right, and you can see how sharp this edge is. If we select height noise, 
that's much more that's a lot easier to see so you can see it's adding that cloud effect to the edge here but we're not going to do the height range we are actually on this case going to adjust the slope range now once i click follow sun direction these slopes settings here which is what i'm actually going to use the texture but i'm going to show you if you click this it removes that because you're specifying that the slope doesn't have a factor only the sun does so let's just turn off the snow so we can see it a little bit better so what has happened here this will distribute your texture based on the direction of the sun's light which this can this texture can be adjusted if we go to the scene tab then the sky and you could see right here the sun direction you can change so if I slide this it took it a minute but you could see the texture has changed completely so if we if we have left the sun direction at its default value which I'm not going to change here so what we want is we want this cliff to appear more than it is right now so what what exactly the sun path does or the sun direction does it, it applies the texture to all the polygons facing the direction angle of the sun and to tell world creator 2 how many polys of the mesh should be included is based on this smoothness slider right down here so by default it's actually set to 0.10 i believe but we're going to increase this because all of these polygons that you can see are facing to a certain degree in the direction of the sun. But if I want to add more polys in the calculation, as you can see, it's increasing more of the mesh. Let's zoom out here. All right, so we got some some of the mesh over here is facing the sun. A lot over here is facing the sun direction. But we don't want this cliff to be defined by the fall sun direction. We want it to be a specific slope. So let's uncheck this. And it totally goes back to its default value. And let's click or let's turn on the snow again. So we want to be sure that all the rocks appear on a certain angle of the slope. So let's go back and click the, the cliffs here. And now since we have unchecked follow sun direction, the slope range and slope smoothness have appeared. So I don't want anything higher than or lower than 45 degrees of an angle to be cliff. So the slope range for the minimum, I'm going to go ahead and set 45 for 45 degrees and you can see every polygon that's between 45 degrees and 90 degrees is going to be textured the cliff texture let's uh increase this to say 25 no 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 wrong 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 let's Let's increase the slope smoothness to say 0.20. There we go. Just add a little bit of a, a smoothness factor to it here. And lastly, let's talk about this last setting, the weight, as well as talk about this setting we skipped up here earlier, the height scale. So the blending between these three textures looks a tad bit off. Like I said, snow doesn't really have this... Uh, gradient effect it's pretty sharp so the snow is only going to fall where it wants to fall so what we're going to do here is we're going to just go ahead and click the snow real fast before we go into what we've just been doing and we don't want the snow to appear on anything higher than a certain degree because snow's not going to stick so much on these really sharp edges so i found before 81 should be good yeah 81 so this has a much better effect on what the cliff and the snow should probably do. I know we have a little bit of, if my computer will cooperate, we have a little bit of grass here, but that's okay. I'm just trying to get the point across, especially over here in this side. But what we could do over here is we're gonna change some of the blending here in just a bit to show you what I'm talking about. So back to weight blending and the height scale here. But before we go to height scale, let's talk about the weight. So the weight defines how strongly the texture is blended in general to the previous texture. So with that, we're going to go ahead and select a cliff and we're going to zoom in here so we can show the difference between the cliff texture and the grass texture. So we're going to zoom down and we're going to slightly decrease the, the weight here. As you can see, 
the weight is allowing the cliff texture to not appear as as well. So the grass texture is becoming more prominent than the cliff texture. This kind of goes hand in hand with the height scale because what height scale does, height scale adjusts the light and darkness of the height map here. By us selecting under general and the height based texturing here, you can see something gradually just changed here. So let's zoom out. And uh oh, what do we do? So what actually what we did is let's go back here. Since we got cliffs selected, let's go ahead and change the value of the weight back to one because the weight typically is something you want to change last after height scale. So let's just go back to where we were. Weight is one and the height scale is one. So what the height scale does, like I said, it it changes the light and darkness values of this height map. By us selecting that height based texturing, that is saying that we want the height map from this check texture to be compared to the height map of this texture or compared to the height map of the snow. The one with the greatest value takes priority over the other in order to show itself on the terrain. So, it, and depending on the order that you have these textures in the layer also has a strong effect on that. So this height scale lets you adjust how much this texture's height map appears lighter or appears darker from its default value. So right now you can see the default, it's kind of hard to tell, but you can see how light the wide areas is, how dark the dark areas are. So if you decrease this height scale, it's making this texture a little bit darker. Or if you select this texture and you decrease the height scale, it's making it darker. So if you make this texture darker and keep this texture the same, all the white values are going to have much more um, power over the white values of the uh, terrain. So if we zoom in here, let's zoom in to where we can see. So now, now that we selected that height based texture, you can see it's a much more fine line. That's because if you look at how bright this cliff's height map is compared to how dark the uh, grass height map is, the cliff is going to take priority over the grass. But if we take the cliff and decrease its height scale, you can see we're darkening the height map of the cliff. Right around here is much more prominent. The grass is starting to take over. And if you bring it all the way to the bottom, that's as low as we could take it, but you're getting a lot of flexibility when you do this. But we want the cliff to have 100% of its height because it's a rock and it should take priority of where the grass appears. Now we could select like we have the grass and delete, decrease its height scale a tad if we wanted to increase just around the edges the rock to be much more pronounced. This doesn't always look so realistic. You have to, it's a lot of give and take. You have to play with it, but it really helps to try and make this as realistic as possible, especially if you're using this grass textures blend map to place grass. But what we can do is zoom out because what's much more uh, prominent here is the difference between snow and the rock because the snow we want to overpower onto the rock. But to do this, we don't always have to worry about the height scale. We can keep the height scale at one, and as we discussed, only change the weight. So if we select the cliff and decrease the weight of it just a tad, we could see now the snow is ever so slightly increasing. Ah, see now it disappeared. That's the threshold of the um, of the cliff. So the, this basically takes the entire texture of the cliff and adjusts its blending effect with the other two textures. I think I think zero point seven five is fine. And with snow, it's it's okay to have this sharp effect. We could blend it a little bit more, you know, change some of the smoothness. But um, you're just gonna have to play around with those values a little bit, especially with the snow. But when you're out far away, it looks pretty convincing. So the biggest thing to consider here is just to play around with a lot of these settings and see what works best with you. There's a lot of different things you can go over. And in a later video, we can go over actually designing a whole landscape from start to finish. These are just some of the tasks uh, you can take to um, adjusting all these properties. 
And it's pretty incredible of what all you can do, but it's a lot to go through. And I understand that, especially whenever you're trying to fumble between the height scale and the weight scale, because the height scale is the value pretty much derived whenever you have the height based texturing applied and the weight. It doesn't matter if height based is selected. It could be with as it is without it, but it just adds that extra level of detail whenever you're considering about blending some textures together, especially whenever we go over later on and with um, combining some biomes. And a couple more things uh, I want to cover that I didn't before here, this height range, just like with the filters, you can adjust it based on relative to ocean. So if you click this, you know, all the snow is going to be that certain height range based on the level of the ocean, which is set at, at zero, uh, not zero here, but under the scene and ocean, you could set the uh, height here to adjust the texture height. This is really useful, especially with you're having an island or a lake or a river and you're wanting a texture of a swampy texture to be based on the height of the ocean or the height of the water. Or if you're at a beach, you could set the texture based on the, the beach. It's a pretty handy feature, especially whenever you wanted to quickly uh, adjust some texturing based on the ocean. And lastly, what I want to go over just real quick is since we discussed about duplicating a texture and changing its properties, I'm going to go ahead and just hide these two because what we're going to do is we're going to take this grass texture and we're going to duplicate it. So we're going to select it, duplicate this texture. And I want this texture to be right next to it. So as you can see, this is on and off. Of course, when we turn this texture off, the, the terrain changes. That's because we have certain text, uh, a different distribution property or different texture property for the lower texture and this texture is the default of course the eliminate terrain or eliminate tiling algorithm changes when you have two different textures on top of each other like this but what we're going to do is since we have two tech two of the same textures on top of each other let's just change its scale let's make this 10 meters so now that this is 10 you can see it's ever so slightly changing, but I want this texture to be based on concave. And I also want to change its shade to something a little bit darker. Let's, let's desaturate it just ever so slightly. All right. So as you could see here, look where this work, where this is applied. If you can exit. All right. So this grass texture has only applied here. Well, what if I don't want that 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 shading effect? What if I want it to just be all the con all of the terrain, but you know, have a uh, surface noise applied? So let's go ahead and just select the default for this. Select the surface noise. Ah, but we didn't change the um, the shading value. But we're gonna go ahead and change the shading back to normal. Just go ahead and select default here. All right, so the shading is back to normal, but we can't really see it. So we're gonna select heat map, and now we can see all the effect taking place. So let's, it's really hard to tell unless you're really up close. But let's turn off the heat map, so everything in red should be slightly bigger. It's very hard to tell, but believe me, it's, it's there. So doing this could be a pretty handy way to take a single texture, combine it a little bit, add make one of them slightly darker in, you know, in a concave area, like near a shaded area. If you want to make it the mountain range pop just a little bit more like we just did. Um, so that's a pretty handy little feature to just make some variation in your textures. And lastly, we're back here to our normal screen here, and I want to show you a couple of the export options here. So if we just go up here click export you can export a splat map or you can export a color map so what this does is it takes all of your textures no matter what the layers are and it exports them together so you can export a color map which combines the entire color of this square terrain here and when you do that what comes up let's just go to What comes up is something like this. So it 
it exports all of the color of the terrain that you just what, that you just created. So right here we have the cliff, some snow on top, and all the grass in between. Now this doesn't export the um, specularity part of it. That that's very dependent on the engine you put in. This is just the color. So when you see something like this combined. That's only because there's no lighting to it. So this is just a diffuse map, just a color map. As well as if you click export and you choose splat map, you can select all the different textures that you want to include on this splat map. Now what this is, is it exports a RGB color map like this. So whenever you want to import it into Unity 5 or Unreal Engine 4, you can do a color map or a weight blend in those programs. So whatever's blue is applied to whatever you set as the blue channel. And that it can also be used to creating or placing your objects on the third party apps like the grass and rocks and trees and things. So you could use these splat maps for that as well. But what if you just want to create or what if you just want to export a black and white alpha map of just one layer? Well, you can do that. Let's go ahead and uh, minimize this. So you select which texture you want to export. So right now I have the cliff texture exported. You can save the heat map. So click save heat map. And it's going to ask you where you want to do it. And the file type is PNG right now. So it exports just the heat map of the entire terrain at that resolution. So on our surface, if we click surface and base, we can see our resolution of our terrain is 2048 by 2048. That'll be the resolution of the texture of this heat map. So if we export the heat map of our cliffs, you'll get something that is similar to this right here. This is an export that I did earlier of just the cliffs. So you everything that is white will have the texture of the cliff and everything that is black will not. So it's an alpha map. It's an alpha texture or a or you could even use it as a height map in some cases if you want. But it is also used in those third party applications to place your textures if you did not want to do this splat map. And splat map by default uh, exports as the uh, target file here. But I changed it so we can go ahead and see the color of the uh, splat map real quick. The final method to export these textures is over here, the sync tool. You press the sync tool and it's going through everything that it's going through. Exporting the splat map, it's giving you exporting the objects and details. Of course, I don't have any. So where this is exported to is in your folder of your of your um, project under sync tool. And it has the height map, the splat map, and the XML file that you would need for those third party applications. And we'll go over even more in depth detail of these export features when we go over the sync tool as well with adding everything that we have here to those third party engines. So don't worry about that. That'll be covered all in depth in a later video as we actually make a terrain from start to finish from here to there. So now that we've gone over the basic concepts and paths to take to adding textures to a terrain, in the next video we are going to take it even further by talking about one of the most powerful tools in World Creator 2. That's the Areas tool. With this, we will be using it for numerous things including some texturing techniques I skipped here, as well as some terrain modeling techniques and object building techniques. So it's going to be a very exciting and long episode, and I hope you stay tuned. So till then, I'll see you in the next one.